All right. Well, without further ado, I really want to once again thank all of you for joining us today. Uh, I know a lot of you. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Aiden. I'm the Director of Growth here at Imprimo, and I, I work on a lot of our content as well. And I'm really excited to be here with our two guests today to uh, talk to you all about the uh, ABCs of NFTs. Now, few emergent technologies have been subject to as much hype, misunderstanding, baseless backlash as the NFT. I think they're most widely known as kind of an over-speculated and hype-driven collector's curio, but the range of possibilities unlocked by them has often played second fiddle to the kind of media-driven circus of misinformation that surrounded them, whether you have strange projects or bored apes or crypto punks, uh, the JPEG art has largely failed to resonate with the com creative community. But what if we told you that everything that you think you know about NFTs is either wrong or off base, or at best, just barely scratching the surface of their potential uses? Fortunately, I'm joined today by our co-founder, chairperson, blockchain visionary, and uh, accomplished copyright lawyer, Rowani Levy, and artist, tech optimist, and educator, Benedict Carpenter Van Barthold, also known as Ben, who are both much more knowledgeable, much more regard than I am. We'll be discussing what NFTs are, what they aren't, some of their current use cases, both general and specific to the art world, and some of their applications, both uh, current and pending as they pertain to the arts. So before we dive into what I'm very confident will be a fascinating and illuminating discussion, I'd like to give both Benedict and Roani the opportunity to introduce themselves in their own words. Romani, I will start with you. First of all, thank you, uh, Aiden, and thank you everybody for joining us. Um, so my name is Romani. I am the CEO, uh, first and foremost, of the Copyright Collective called Access Copyright here in Canada. We manage the reuse rights uh, for writers, visual artists, and publishers. Um, and in 2016, we started looking at the future of rights management, and that's where we kept um, encountering blockchain and lots of promises about how blockchain is going, was going to revolutionize how content is monetized, how it is tracked, um, and how creators are going to get compensated uh, into the future. So we started playing around with blockchain in order to understand the promises and, and challenges and opportunities. Uh, and that's how we uh, ended up launching an innovation lab in 2018 called Prescient and working uh, with Blockchain KX and launching in Primo, uh, which is kind of like a LinkedIn for visual artists where artists are also uh, under the hood kind of doing, making creation claims that are time stamped to, uh, to Blockchain. That's great. Thanks, Rohani. Uh, ben, over to you. Thanks, Aidan. And uh, thanks everyone for joining today. Um, I'm an artist uh, and um, I'm not a digital artist particularly. I work with uh, expressive media and metal through technologies that are thousands of years old. Nevertheless, I've always been interested by the connection that there is between um, an artist's vision on the one hand and the tools that are available to them on the other. And I don't see there as being any distinction between the two. I think um, art is something that has evolved as technology is involved and at its best, both have shaped each other. And I think the next, uh, we're living through an incredibly peri in interesting period right now, an incredibly interesting and disruptive period right now. And um, with another hat on, I'm absolutely thrilled and excited to be part of a team building an innovative uh, community for connecting artists and their audience, which is called Viewnight. And um, that's got uh, uses AI to help um, create meaningful connections between artists and audiences, and also to solve what I see as being a really long standing problem in the art market, which NFTs can also address, which is uh, enabling creatives to connect with what is otherwise an incredibly gated, exclusive, and undemocratic industry. Uh, and I think it's, it's, it's possible that's going to be something that, um, that we, we touch on in today's uh, discussion. 
So, as I said, I think we're living through interesting times, lots of um, hazards, plenty of opportunities. Awesome. Thank you for that. I, uh, I agree with all of the above, and I'm really excited to jump into this. Um, I do want to start off pretty simple in my line of questioning, because I, I myself have, up until recently, been a bit of a, a Luddite in terms of uh, these emergent Web3 technologies. And I'm assuming a lot of you in this audience are kind of like me and up until, you know, like me up until recently, couldn't tell you the difference between fungibility, non-fungibility, uh, crypto, Bitcoin. So for the uninitiated, uh, Rwani, I'm going to field this question to you first. Can you explain what an NFT is? What makes it unique from cryptocurrency? Okay, thank you. Can you hear me better now? Yeah, much, much better. Okay, thank you about that. So actually, it's worth spending just um, a couple of minutes, not too many, on some basic concepts to understand, to be able to appreciate a little bit more the transformation ahead of us. So when we talk about blockchain, some of the things that we're actually talking about is tokens. You'll often hear the tokenization of everything, whether it's creating a token for something that first resided and was created digitally, or a token that represents an in real life assets. So whether it's a physical painting that hangs behind you or, or a home uh, that you live in. So everything in this Web3 world, as we look forward, we're talking about tokens, things will get tokenized. And the reason for tokenizing them is to make it more easily to transfer ownership or to provide access to them in a digital world. Okay, so that's kind of the, the, con the, the context. Now, a token is essentially a digital representation of something of value, right? It could be a piece of artwork, it could be a home, it could be something that is equivalent to a dollar bill, right? So fiat currency, an actual currency. So it could be monetary, it could be rights, like the right to vote in a governance structure or the right to a work, uh, a creative work. It could be something that is natively digital, like a PDF of something or, or a JPEG or a photograph, or it could be something that exists in the real world, right? So tokens can represent uh, many things in this Web3 world. The difference between fungible and non-fungible is essentially you know, uh, linked to the meaning of fungibility. So something that is fungible is something that could be exchanged for each other and without losing value. So a dollar bill, every dollar bill has the same value. That's fungible. That's the traditional um, expression of fungibility uh, is a, a currency, a fiat currency. Most things in the world are actually non-fungible. Your house is non-fungible. The art behind you is non-fungible. So most things in the world are non-fungible. And that is when the different representations are the, with something which is unique. It could be one of one, or it could be one of 10. If there is a series, that's non-fungible. Another thing to keep in mind is what is blockchain. I think at this point, many people have heard about blockchain and understand it, that it's a ledger. So it's just a recording system. You know, just like your bank account is a recording system, it's a ledger. What's interesting about this ledger is that it is uh, shared amongst many people. It is open, so people can see what's on the ledger. The next element that's really important is in this web thing, Web3 world, everything is linked via a digital wallet. So that's your unique ID on this ledger. And so a token that you own will be connected to your wallet, to your unique ID on this ledger. And again, a reminder is that the ledger, everybody can see it. So anybody can see that you own a token or whether it's an NFT or a Bitcoin on this open uh, wallet, uh, on this open ledger. And the third element that's important to, uh, to highlight, which, which makes Web3 so powerful, and which is why everybody wants, people want to tokenize everything, is that the token and the behavior around the token, the ownership of the token, can be automated through what is called a smart contract. 
you probably have heard of the term smart contract. Yes. Smart contract is essentially a small piece of software that is also on the blockchain so that everybody can see what the automation around this token is about. An example that you've probably heard of is when an NFT of a piece of art transfers ownership. So when it goes from one wallet to another wallet, and it does so in exchange for currency, five ETH, two Bitcoins, or a stable coin, you know, 200 USD dollars. When it does that, so if the, if the NFT changes wallet for an amount, 10% of that value will go back to the wallet of the creator. Okay, and this is essentially the resale right being automated in a digital ecosystem in a way that happens automatically and that everybody can see is happening. So that's the, the beauty of, of this Web3 environment. It's tokens. So things of value are being tokenized. The tokens are connected to wallets, electronic wallets. So that's how ownership happens through the connection of something that is tokenized and connected to a wallet. All of that information is stored on a distributed open ledger so that everybody could see it. That's the blockchain. And uh, smart contracts can be put at play to automate certain things. That makes sense. So all of a sudden, then you have this digital ecosystem where there's an enhanced level of transparency and there's a kind of fundamental decentralization where these tra transactions are interacting in a way that doesn't need the intervention of a central authority. And then you have these smart contracts that are stipulating the terms attached to these tokens. Is that perfect? Absolutely correct. Amazing. Yeah. So if nice. I followed that, I'm very confident that. Uh, at least most of our audience followed that as well. Um, can you elaborate on the functionality of smart contract? So it, smart contracts can do a limitless number of things, but essentially a smart contract will move tokens around. Remember tokens represent something of value. Mm -hmm. They could represent a piece of art. They could represent uh, digital art physical art or anything else, right? And the smart contract will dictate if this thing happens, then do Y, right? So it's a basic piece of programming. If X, do Y. Um, if, for example, if you wanted to have an insurance contract uh, about the cancellation of a flight, the contract, the smart contract you would say, if this flight gets canceled, then pay a thousand dollars to the owner of this wallet and it could happen automatically as the smart contract goes on the 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 website that tracks flights to find out whether flight x got canceled and if it gets canceled there's an automatic payment that happens so that's just an example of how smart contracts can be used to automate in transactions the one that we talk about a lot in the art world is the artist resale right. If there's a transfer of ownership of a token that represents a piece of art for a value, transfer X percent of that value to the wallet of Y. That makes a lot of sense. Fantastic. I do see some questions running in through the chat. Um, I can assure you we will get to you a little later on. Um, but I think there is a really good overarching theme here that plays in one of my next questions. What do you actually own when you purchase an NFT? Because I think there's a lot of confusion around that. I've heard it referred to as owning a receipt, but given that the smart contract is so flexible, I think there's a little more at play here. So maybe you can explain what that actual ownership entails, and then some use cases for that ownership that maybe wouldn't be the first thing that comes to somebody's mind, both generally and as pertains to the fine art world. 
Yeah, that's a very good question. So what you own in the NFT world, you own a certificate of ownership, okay? So it's the person who owns the NFT. So the person who wallet is attached to this NFT owns what is uh, connected to that NFT, okay? So uh, generally, the, the, we talk about the NFT being on the blockchain. Usually the art is not on the blockchain, even if it's a digital native piece of art the art itself is not on the blockchain what is registered on the blockchain the connection between the nft the tokenization of an asset mm -hmm. to uh, the person who owns who now owns the asset so you own the certificate of ownership for it the asset itself especially if it's a digital uh, work like a board eight for example it mm -hmm. will be on a traditional uh, repository and all there is in the in the NFT itself is a link to the actual image of the board ape. So it doesn't stop somebody else from accessing the same image, from copying the same image, um, but they do not own the image. So as the image increases in value, they're not able to sell it for that increased value. Now the other thing to to remember. Um, when you buy an NFT, particularly when it relates to a creative assets, it's like buying a book. You actually don't own the copyright in the book. All you own is the book. So when you get, when you buy an NFT to a visual art, unless there is a transfer of the copyright or a license for the use of the content, all you own is the right to say that you own the NFT. You're not able to make reproductions of it. You're not able to commercialize the, the art. You can't put it in a book. Uh, you can't make a movie out of it, et cetera. So you always need to read the fine print to find out what exactly do you own with respect to the intellectual property around the creative work. It's fascinating. I, I, I think there is some kind of and, and we'll get to some interesting use cases because I know there have been use cases in fine art surrounding uh, NFTs, but I do think there is a bit of a disconnect between consumers of the existing NFT art, the mainstream of NFT art, and the traditional fine art collector. And I think I'm seeing that sentiment echoed coming in through the chat. Um, so I think it is fair to say that you know the value of these things across the board are the result of an agreement of a basic sort of social contract, much like any fiat currency or even a basic social structure. Um, NFTs are pretty new, novel, they're untested, but how does this technology find an interaction with a traditional collector? That's a good question. So there is, first of all, it has uh, allowed the explosion of uh, digital art. Uh, you know, setting aside board apes and whether we think board apes are actually art, but there is a lot of creativity that is happening and talent around digital art. So now by being able to create um, almost like a, a envelop it and have someone be able to own the right to a digital piece of art, we've allowed for um, the monetization of digital art in a way that was not possible before. So that's one area. One important thing to think about is that NFTs and blockchain itself, with the interplay of wallets, which, you know, if you own the access to the wallet, you're, it's like a cryptographic signature. And that cryptographic signature is a lot more secure than the signature on a physical painting. If there is a lot more ways to authenticate that the person that signed something with that cryptographic signature is in fact the person who claims to be the artist, for example, than a signature on a painting which could a lot more easily be forged. If you connect the in real life asset with the cryptographic signature through a RFID tag, for example, that is tamper proof. And every time the NFT is moved, it represents the ownership of the physical painting. Now you have provenance that is being tracked in a way that was not possible uh, in the past. 
So provenance is a big use case. We're seeing it today for luxury goods. Okay, so if you want to go and buy a Gucci bag, um, a lot of luxury goods right now are actually using blockchain in order to authenticate the physical bag as being an original. And the registration, when the bag gets moved around from one person to the next, kind of connects the NFT of the bag with the physical bag itself and increases the value of the physical bag. So you could bag, you could see that over time, people are not gonna buy a Gucci bag unless they're also transferred the ownership of the NFT to that bag so that they could prove that they actually have an original Gucci bag, right? So this is happening more and more and more in the luxury world. And you could see how that example, that use case can marry itself very, very well with fine arts. For sure. Um, that actually is an interesting segue. Uh, ben, you brought up something when we were talking about uh, quite a bit more of a hard digital integration of the fashion world and the NFTs, people actually purchasing things in digital. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about that for our audience. Um, and get your perspective on some of these things that are going on today, the way this technology is interacting with fine arts. Um, you shared with me a bunch of very compelling examples um, and where you think kind of this is all going. Yeah, for sure. So just to pick up where Rowani um, left off uh, with the luxury goods piece, um, I was uh, uh, hearing um, just recently about uh, a, a product which was launched by Nike and um, it's sold with an NFT in the way that Ryan has described, but then the owner of the NFT can then use, it's got um, an RFID chip in the garment and that enables, um, that unlocks um, a sort of augmented reality experience so that the wearer of the product can appear having a pair of wings behind them. No, so it's an example of how the uh, the ownership of the NFT can be used to um, as a sort of way of unlocking additional content as well as managing the ownership in the luxury goods market, which is a creative application of the technology, as well as being about um, simple provenance and ownership. But moving from the world of um, luxury fashion to, yes. <laughs> uh, to, to to the art world which doesn't like to think of itself as purveying luxury goods but actually probably is um i'm going to start off with some general observations and uh, then give a few examples so first up if you're new to all of this stuff my advice to you would not be to satisfy your curiosity by heading over to OpenSea, which is the largest marketplace to see what's out there because most of the work that you see there is banal you know it's culturally it's <laughs> of, of, is that, yeah well maybe but it's <laughs> of, of, of i'd say rather dubious value and um i might come on later on to say something about authenticity in that marketplace as well mm -hmm. so instead i'd go to a um curated collection places that i'd recommend you start would be og.art artworld.com and in artworld.com there is no o so it's a r t w r l d.com artblocks.io and a r s n l.art those are four curated collections of um nfts some of them are very small collections so at the moment um ours nl have only worked with two artists but their stuff is uh, so much more, I think, interesting than what you're going to encounter in the wild, so to speak. Now, I do feel a little bit conflicted about giving you that advice because one of the things that blockchain promises is, which is something that I'm really passionate and excited about, is the potential for technology to democratize access to markets for creators and access to culture for the general public. Um, the art world is one of the most vertical, hierarchical, exclusive, opaque markets you could possibly imagine. And um, 
there are all sorts of um, hazards in that for creatives. And uh, what one of the things that blockchain potentially will enable is transparency in a marketplace and access to a marketplace which is equitable and secure. So as I said, I do feel a little bit strange giving you, like your entry to it should be a bunch of highly curated experiences, but nevertheless, that probably is the right way to start right now. I want to rewind a bit though and say, so the art world is not some Johnny come lately to the NFT marketplace. In fact, um, a pair of artists, uh, Jennifer and Kevin McCoy, way back a decade ago in 2013, began a project uh, which was eventually minted in 2014 on a slightly obscure chain called Namecoin, which was a fork from Bitcoin. And that was the first ever NFT before the name was created. Now, um, the McCoys have a practice which um, involves collaging um, in a, from uh, existing culture. So one example is um, Starsky and Hutch, the TV show, which they freezed frame by frame and then reordered depending on some rather arbitrary traits, such as the presence of a yellow Volkswagen in the shot. And once they'd ordered that, they would collate it onto a CD and that would be their piece of art. So they were really interested in um, that kind of uh, digital technology, which can be copied incredibly easily. And that's got in certain inherent problems because it's then very difficult to demonstrate your ownership and your provenance of your work. And that was the problem that they were trying to solve when they were playing around on Namecoin well before um, the term NFT was coined. And I think that's probably before the Ethereum blockchain, which most of the art world ecologies built, was created. There are quite a few artists that are working in that space, which is between provenance, money, value, and ideas of those. Uh, I'll give you a few more examples. Probably the most famous is, is, uh, is Damien Hurst and his project, which with um, characteristic vulgarity uh, was called Currency, um, was a series of 10,000 dot paintings that when they were created, were created physically, but also had an NFT minted, which was their sort of corresponding other. And purchasers of these objects had one year to decide whether they wanted the NFT or whether they wanted the painting. The paintings are quite small, they're on handmade paper, 20 centimeters by 30 centimeters. And he had each one franked with a hologram of his face to make it a little bit more like money. And at the end of the year, the owners of these paintings, which were purchased by lottery and the ticket cost $2,000, had to decide whether they wanted the painting or the NFT. If they wanted to keep the painting, the NFT was burnt which means it was sent to a wallet that it can't be retrieved from, so it's effectively lost, but they kept the painting. If they wanted to keep the NFT in their wallet, in the way that Rowani has described, the painting was burned. 50-50 were the results. 50-50. 50-50, almost exactly 50-50. And when I looked up the figures, I was slightly, um, I don't know why I went, as, actually this is not really relevant, but the results were almost exactly the same as the Brexit referendum in the UK. It was actually 52 <laughs> 48. I, mean, um, I do think, I mentioned this to you before, but I think the, uh, the adoption of this and the agreement of these as, uh, digital assets as having an inherent value as desirable as a physical object is indicative of a certain societal split. I wouldn't go so far as to draw a, far, a false correlation to the Brexit results versus the, uh, <laughs> the results of that, but it's it's hard not to see it when it's right in front of you like that. I think Banksy had a, not Banksy, but there was an artist out of New York that had a similar project where he purchased a Banksy, minted an NFT and set it on fire. That's right, so, the burnt Banksy project. So to those of you who've asked me, do you have to burn your art when you mint it as an NFT? You absolutely do not, unless you are operating at an extraordinarily pretentious level of conceptual uh, self-indulgence. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's it's not essential uh, to to enter this economy and to forswear all physical belongings. 
You know, you're still allowed <laughs> to keep physical stuff as well as hold digital assets. A couple of other um, projects I want to mention, which seem to me to be commenting on, in some way on some of the strangeness of this marketplace. There's one by a British artist called Matt Collishaw called um, Heterosis. And um, this collection is, um, it's got a generative aspect. So the NFTs are of flowers with um, traits that are more or less rare. And you can breed your flower with the flower of somebody else to create, you know, potentially rarer objects. And the work's rather beautiful, but I think he's deliberately referencing tulip mania. Mm. The craze for very expensive tulip bulbs that gripped Europe in, I think it was the 18th century. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, the tulips, tulip fever. <laughs> tulip fever, exactly. Yes. Um, and uh, kind of a conceptually related project by an artist called um, Neither Confirm, who created a series of 26 NFTs of um, the see, I think it was called Turkish rugs, which should have been a warning sign for the purchasers. <laughs> he created wow. a series of 26 rugs. And yeah. um, one of the things that people don't realize when they're buying an NFT is, and Romani has been very clear about this, you're not necessarily buying the, the, the there is a difference between the blockchain entry and the media file. They're not the same thing. So the blockchain entry points to where the file is, but it isn't the file. Now, if depending on how on how the file is saved, because there are some technological workarounds for this, but if let's say it just points to a file which is on an ordinary server, that can still be tampered with. And that's exactly what this guy did. So he sold a collection of 26 of these Turkish rugs. A couple of months after he'd sold the last one, he switched all of the files for photographs of carpets. And so he rugged, which is uh, uh, a term which is used in, in uh, blockchain as for sort of um, pulling the rug out from underneath somebody. He rugged the whole lot of them. And the collectors had no recourse because they, they actually hadn't bought the artwork, they'd bought the blockchain entry. Now, in a case like that, would the smart contract, Ronnie, have kind of permitted him to do that most likely? So this is another, um, we're still very early, both in the types of use cases, the experimentation, the social commentary that is being done through different art-based projects around NFTs. Um, and what I described in terms of the NFT connected, for example, to a smart contract in order to automate the resale right. Uh, there are actually very few platforms that have the NFT connected to the smart contract itself, right? Uh, and there's technical difficulties why we're not there yet, but that is, I think, where we're going to eventually end up. So if it was properly done, then it could have been possible. It is possible to include the digital file in the blockchain itself, but it's very expensive to do it that way. Now, there are newer and newer blockchains or different blockchains that are coming on board to make the computation cost lower so that it will eventually be possible to uh, and feasible to include the actual digital asset within the token information and within the smart contract itself. So over time, we're going to see less and less of that. Um, the other challenge is that even once we're there, we need to learn. So there's a bit of education. We need to learn how to read the smart contracts to make sure <laughs> that <laughs> of course. the contract is doing what people say it's doing. So um, as the, the, the market and the technology evolves, there are organizations and groups of people whose mission is to kind of translate smart contracts for the average person so that we could audit and verify what the smart contracts are actually doing. So that's, uh, that's going to happen over time. But I want to go back to something that Ben was saying in terms of the democratization of the art market. Um, one of the things that I'm very excited about is uh, the opportunity for artists to create and reward their own communities of fans directly. 
So one of the things that you can do with NFT, we've talked a lot about NFT being connected in some ways to a piece of art, but the mm -hmm. NFT can also just be like a ticket or a reward system uh, for, for your fans, right? And so anybody that wants to support you can buy an NFT for let's say just $10. And that, that purchase of the NFT perhaps gives that fan the opportunity to contribute or to vote on where your project should go next uh, or to get access to an exclusive uh, event with you or an exclusive Zoom call with you, that type of thing. So now you could start in a um, distributed way, connecting directly with your fans um, having them support you in different ways, not just in buying your art, but in different ways uh, and rewarding them with different things as well. Mm. There are some really interesting examples of that um, in the art world already. Um, there's a British artist called uh, Holly Herndon who's um, set up a DAO, um, which is uh, a way of, of um, a DAO is a kind of cooperative where the voting rights are through um, tokens and it's managed on the blockchain in a secure and transparent way. And she set up a DAO to control um, the way in which her digitized image, her kind of meta human, if you like, is productive. So she's a, she's a singer and a visual artist and you can, um, participate in that sort of decision-making process, which Rowani has described, to determine how her digital voice or her image should be used in creative endeavors uh, in the future. And I think it's, a, a you know, as um, we rub up against generative AI, and as that starts to incorporate human creative content, this is potentially one way in which humans, the human creatives can retain a degree of um, control. And it's also a way in which they can participate with other people uh, in a creatively exciting, exciting way. There aren't very many individual artists who are working in that space. It's so new. Um, but um, you know, I think that we will see some, you know, really interesting applications of blockchain in that, you know, in that space. I think that what we're still discovering is what an N what NFTs are as a medium. So mm -hmm. all of the examples that I've given are um, probably with the exception of the McCoys, they are a kind of, that th there are elements of, um, of satire or questioning about them. Now, there are other examples that I could give where there's more of what I would call as a sort of exemplary fit between the form and the content. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to steal your own words here. You referenced uh, Marshall McLuhan before talking about this, the medium is the message. And I, I think it's fair to say that, uh, I do want to address this because I've been noticing the chat. Um, our intent here is to discuss the technology, not to evangelize it in any way. I think there's a tremendous amount of possibility, but I think it also raises a, a ton of valid and legitimate questions that would, um, you know, that are worth asking when one works in a physical medium or one is accustomed to a physical medium. So a lot of these projects are, we could say, like, as you said, satirical or gently critical of the, uh, the nature of the NFT, of that fleeting comment on ownership, that, that fleeting, sorry, nature of ownership that they represent, where you, you've purchased something, and that is theoretically attached to something, but we're still ironing this out. Um, well, yeah, um, the um, situation as Rowan has described it is that the, in most cases, the NFT functions like a kind of pointer to where an asset mm -hmm. is. And there might be metadata which describes what you're actually buying and there might be a contract which governs how it can be used. There might not be. So you've got to <laughs> you've got to become adept as the as a, neither confirmed demonstrated at actually checking what it is you're really buying. 
But there are um, there are some ways in which art can be created entirely on chain, which get around the incredible expense of up, of directly uploading an entire JPEG or an entire film onto the blockchain. Mm -hmm. um, and it's partly in reaction to um, some rug pulling in in this market that. Crypto punks, who I don't think are artistically very interesting, but are nevertheless of very important players in this space, have moved all of their work, all of their artwork on chain as um, uh, SVG files, which are directly coded into the blockchain. So um, vector graphic files to create these small 24 pixel squared um, images that are the profile pictures that people spend so much money to acquire. But a more interesting example of that is I think the Artblocks platform. Artblocks is um, a platform for artists who are working generatively where the code which creates the image is what is written onto the chain, not the image itself. So when someone buys a piece of this generative art, the NFT that they buy is, um, you could think of it as being like a key, which is individual because it's an NFT mm -hmm. to the purchaser. And when, you, when the key is put into the code, which is on the chain, it sort of winds it up. And as a result of that mechanism, an image is created and the image is created live. It's not stored as a JPEG. So the code lives on chain and the key lives on chain. And anytime you want to see your artwork, you can have it generated. That way, if Artblocks is no longer financially viable, if they close, if they disappear for whatever reason, because the code is on the blockchain in this immutable form, and because the owner of the NFT has got that key, which is on the blockchain and is also immutable, they can, whenever they like, have their generative art regenerated. Um, one of the artists that they work with is someone called Emily G, which is X-I-E. And um, I think her work's really beautiful. Uh, what I find interesting about her practice is that it doesn't just remain digital because she, you know, you can, it's, it's like any kind of printmaking practice. You can get high quality prints from it and then live with that art. But it seems to me to be a kind of exemplary use of this technology because the form that her work takes kind of needs, relies on that technology. There is that fit that I mentioned between the form and the content there, um, which is still unusual. Um, now, that doesn't mean that I think blockchain technology is without value for people like me who don't work like that. I make drawings and um, physical artworks. I'm, I'm excited by... Um, the applications of blockchain technology, which might mean that I never get any of my work orphaned again, which is an experience I've had as an artist. I had um, a very large sculpture that was in a public collection. Well, it was owned by a charity and they decided to dissolve the collection. So they auctioned the whole lot at Sotheby's. It's a big piece of work of mine. It's a, you know, it was one of my, I suppose, more significant pieces of work, great big bronze piece, about eight foot in its longest dimension. And it was sold at Sotheby's, um, which was a relief because it would have been embarrassing if no one had bought it. But I never got to find out who bought it. And I don't know where the work is. So it's lost to me. Now, it would be possible to manage that kind of thing, I believe, through a smart contract, if the smart contract is written in the right way. The other thing that aggrieved me about that sale was that I didn't get any money out of it. And I still believe I should have done. The sale happened in the UK and the UK is something of a pioneering jurisdiction for artists resale. So I think I should have got 4% and instead I got a kick in the pants. <laughs> but I wasn't very happy about that. I lost, I lost the work. And my experience there is not unusual in fact, there's a sort of point that I think can happen in artists' careers that where if you're if you do well, if you're lucky and there's a you, you know you have a moment, 
you go from being um, a sort of naive creator who just wants to make work to suddenly realizing that there's a kind of economy out there and it doesn't necessarily have your best interests at heart. And then you think with retrospect, I should have done all of this stuff differently. Of course. I, I'm, I'm most interested in blockchain as a way of um, being able to control my IP, hopefully, in the future. But that doesn't mean I, I can't also appreciate the creative uses of it, where it's not just a platform, it's also a medium, it's a genuine artistic medium. I, I think that's really uh, well expressed. And one thing that's interesting with NFTs, so initially all the fuss around NFTs was with CryptoKitties and and uh, crypto punks, and then Board Art Club, Art Club, and then all this generative arts. But now, increasingly, we're talking about NFTs in the context of uh, real-world assets, and that's where all the interest is. Actually, that's where a lot more of the VC money is going is in this real-world assets class where NFTs are being used in order to manage the real world asset, whether it's to track its provenance, uh, whether it's to share ownership so that you could have fractional ownership of a real world asset. So you could have fractional ownership of your sculpture that is owned by many, many people, as opposed to just being owned by one person, which is very difficult to do today. It's not, you know, it's not impossible, but it's very difficult to do. And yet creating these NFTs and using these NFTs are being used to own fractional ownership and then transfer that fractional ownership of things like buildings, right? And, and uh, there are lots of regulatory issues there and people are working through them or working around them, uh, but not ignoring them. I, I really recommend that you don't ignore those regulatory issues. <laughs> But it certainly is, uh, you could see a path now uh, to being able to uh, create that provenance, allow the artist to have some level of control and information about where the artwork is, um, and, and also to uh, have the financialization more in control of how a value is being generated and shared around your creative works. Mm. really well expressed. Thank you for that, Romani. Um, as an artist who doesn't work in digital mediums, really, who leverages technologies, um, who is optimistic and interested in them, uh, Ben, have you used NFTs in your own practice or have you explored that at all yet? Um, what aspect of that, how far have you gotten into that process and will you ever go through? With minting one. I definitely will go through with minting one. I am not, it's not something I've done yet. Um, mm -hmm. Because I, I'm not going to do it for the sake of doing it. Um, I'm most interested in the NFT for a way of thinking about and playing with ideas of authenticity within my own practice. And I think that that's really important for you to bear in mind. If, you, if you're curious about this stuff, and as I said, if you go into OpenSea, a statistic you might want to bear in mind is about 80% of the work on OpenSea is scam. So um, blockchain is a great technology for ensuring that once an, a data has been entered, the data is looked after. But what it doesn't do is ensure that the data when it is entered is accurate. So if you put rubbish in, that rubbish just gets preserved. Um, and I'm, I'm interested in that moment of, um, of signing. I'm interested in the moment of, of creating that sort of authentic gesture. And also more broadly in ideas of what authenticity means, particularly today when we're living in an age where there's um, generative AI. Um, so I've gone some way down that journey, Aidan. Um, one of the things I've done, because there are cases currently where artists only discover that they've been defrauded once they try to mint an NFT. One of the things I've done 
that doesn't take very long and I would advocate for is to open an account on OpenSea and maybe Foundation or one or two other platforms where you say who you are and um, link that to your um, social media presence, get that verified, link that to your website, and that will make it harder for somebody to fraudulently sell NFTs of your work because a buyer who is operating any kind of due diligence will check to see if there are other accounts in that person's name and they will take the first account that's opened as one which is most likely to be authentic. Now, if you're a user of Imprimo, which requires you to verify your identity, then you could link your account, couldn't you? You could say, um, you could have that as your, as your website and that would help to build trust further still. Just as an interesting observation, I mentioned earlier the artist who sold his soul. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, that young Dutch artist. And in advance of this meeting, I went on to OpenSea to see if he'd done anything else. And he hasn't. But there are now several other people pretending to be him who are selling <laughs> his soul over and over again. And so there are collectors out there who think they've got the soul of a young Dutch art student who've actually got some other schmuck soul, you know. Um, <laughs> so there are things that you can do to protect yourself as an artist. And uh, that, that would be my, my suggestion, to, uh, I think, would be to, to actually engage, even if you're not interested in minting work yourself, to engage with those marketplaces sufficiently to have a presence. It Ben, thank you for uh, plugging Imprimo there. That actually takes me uh, to how we ended up building Imprimo, why we ended up building Imprimo. Um, you call it rubbish. We called it the junk in, junk out uh, theory. <laughs> and one of the first things we did, uh, in fact, this was in 2017, we did this uh, proof of concept. So we actually built a smart contract. It was in the very early days. The term NFT was not even well known yet. So we used a smart contract to uh, on the Ethereum blockchain to create this fan-to-fan -fan sale of an ebook. Okay, and we wanted to see how that would work. We moved the intermediary, allowed two fans to exchange an ebook and ensure that when that happens, when that transfer happens, there is a redistribution of the royalties automatically that, you know, go to the writer and the publisher and the jacket cover artist and in our use case the fan that stimulated the sale was also going to get a reward so it created this you know uh this this virtual marketing that your fans are now able to promote the works for you and sell your works for you so we actually called it influencer for the fan to fan sale of an ebook we did this on the uh, in the sandbox, so we didn't kind of deploy in the wild the actual uh, smart contract. We were just doing it to understand the technology and see where this is going to take us. And when we did it and we went through the workflow, the question we kept, and, and it worked, like it was like, it's one thing to describe it. It's another thing to actually work, do the workflow and see the wallets and see how the value exchange happens and the unlocking of the ebook happens as well once there's a sale and a transfer of, of, uh, of in this case it was it was ETH uh, of uh, some a currency of some sort. So for me it, it, it is when I drank the Kool-Aid. It's when for me the penny dropped and I was like, oh yeah, now I get it. I get what everybody thinks this is like revolutionary. I get it. But I was also very concerned about who's going to make sure that the person that's attaching the ebook, the digital asset, the artwork to the smart contract, whose wallet is connected to, so when there's a value exchange, there's, you know, value goes back into the wallet. Who's going to make sure that it is a person who is actually has the rights to do so? And what, I, what we saw when we looked at all these different projects that were happening in the blockchain space with Creative Works back in 2017, we saw exactly the same thing as we, as we see in Web2. And that is just the, the blind belief that if the person uploads a work and says, I own the copyright, that all is good. And there's no actual way to verify 
that the person who's uploading and monetizing the work actually has the right or even just made a claim to have the right and is able to be identified as the owner. And that's when we realize that unless we were deliberate in solving attribution, what we call the attribution problem in Web3, what's going to happen in this new web environment is actually going to be worse for creators than what happened in Web2 when we had P2P selling of, or sharing of music and that type of thing. Because now we have actual incentives for bad actors. And we talked a lot about the rug pulls and all of the scams. There's real incentive because there's real like fiat equivalent stuff that you could easily convert into money to buy your porch. Porsche, uh, you know, that's happening on Web3. And so we figured solving attribution is the work that we should be doing as a copyright management organization who wants to make sure that creators get paid for the use of their work. And that's how we got to Imprimo. So on the front end, Imprimo is a LinkedIn for visual artists. So it allows you to kind of track your career, upload your portfolio and make creation claims. And on the back end, it actually timestamps on blockchain. We actually use the Bitcoin blockchain. Your creation claim, we verify your ID, and so there's a self-assessment uh, or a self-claim that is made. There's no third party making the claim or verifying your claim for you. But at least now we know the person who is making the claim. Um, it's transparent. We could find them. There's a cryptographic signature behind the scene as well that is used. So that that is part of what is registered on blockchain. We have on our kind of tech roadmap more integration with other really interesting technology, which makes this claim even more and more robust and more useful. But we needed to start somewhere. And these are the building blocks for pro proper attribution. Part of the building block is people need to be able to verify who's made a claim and then services, smart contracts, other Web3 platform need to be able to check against these claims uh, as a first check before things are uploaded and monetized, whether it's in an NFT, a smart contract, or just a Web2 platform. Yeah, and for me, Rowani, I think thinking about how I might do that, the, um, I wasn't, it, it, it wasn't that function that brought me to Imprimo, but it is actually probably the easiest way in which I can demonstrate that I am who I say I am. Exactly. It's like having a kind of um, in-house notary. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Do you, do you think though it's, it's I mean, we're talking about um, how artists can um, engage with blockchain technology to um, ensure that at the very least, if their work is monetized, they don't lose out. But I mean, not all artists are going to be interested in monetizing their work, and some artists will feel kind of uncomfortable about that. Do you think that they should still be aware of these technologies and, and engage with them? I think it's you can't um, turn a blind eye to to what's happening. Um, it's going to change. You know, it's it's. Uh, I often give the example of how. Um, Back when we, like when we, I, I've been working around create the creative sectors and uh, the internet and watching the evolution from web one to web two to web three. I was a policy analyst in the Canadian federal government working on copyright policy in the early nineties. And we were looking at the impact that the information superhighway, because that's how the internet was called by then, was going to have on the monetization of creative works and whether our copyright act was uh, purpose designed, whether it would be able to handle it. This was back in the 90s. Had you told me that um, industries were going to get, of uh, uh, the likes of taxis driving, was going to get transformed by the internet, I would never have believed it, right? Never have believed it. I think it is important, it, without being a tech expert, without you know getting into the nitty gritty of how it works, I think it is important to keep an eye and stay informed about the technology because otherwise it will blindside you. Mm -hmm. Right now we're talking about uh, Web3 and it's digital artists that are most engaged, et cetera. But 
you know, tomorrow and the tomorrow may be in three years, maybe in five years, maybe in 15 years, but tomorrow it's a, an area of transformation that you will never have expected to happen. Um, and it will, it will affect you. It will, it will come your way. Um, even if you don't work in a digital space. Hmm. That's very, very well put. And I think it comes to a, a point that I've considered a lot um, that there, and I, I can say for the three of us and uh, everybody else in this event today, we're all aging marvelously, but there is a generational cohort uh, a few years below all of us that lives through their computer, yep. that interacts through their computer. So digital assets will hold a value to them and an appeal to them that might not make sense to those of us who are more intimately acquainted with the traditions of a physical world and, and physical ownership. Um, so I think staying abreast of that, as you said, Bonnie, is going to really work in the favor of a lot of artists, even if they don't choose to work in that medium today. We're not necessarily in control, in full control of the direction that things are going and refusing to engage with something which is a fantastic point and a callback I will make to uh, your last event with us, Ben. Refusing to engage with something is not generally the best approach to dealing with it. Absolutely not. I think it would be a big mistake. I mean, my feeling is that I'm, I, I'm among other things, I'm, I'm an academic at Nottingham Trent University and teach art, uh, work in an art school. And um, I'm dismayed by the lack of engagement there is in higher education with, with the direction this technology is going in. Because, um, you know, th these revolutions in blockchain technology and uh, generative AI are happening with or without the participation of higher education or with or without the participation of creatives. And what we need to do as creatives is engage, I think, as much as possible in what's happening in that space, both so that we can profit from it or not get trampled underfoot. But ideally, to help shape it. And that's, I mean, what's something that I've, I mean, as I said at the beginning, I'm really privileged and delighted to be involved with ViewNight, which is a project which I think does a lot of those things. Um, and and uh, any opportunity that I have to um, connect my students, I think, with, with exposure to this sort of conversation, whether it's blockchain, whether it's um, authenticating your ID um, to, 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 to build that, creation story and that provenance online, or whether it's learning how generative AI works, um, you know, I'll, I'll take that. And I'm really actually dismayed by how little HE has moved into that area and how ill-prepared. I think um, we are for serving our students on an ongoing basis. And I think it's because we're just being outpaced. You know, the, the technology is moving so quickly and the institutions that have built our culture, not just HE, but also I think the law, mm -hmm. uh, this would be another example. They move more slowly than the technological innovation, which is like running a pace, like, you know, that engine's running hot. And, um, I, you know, we ha I, I, I feel if I can do something to help try and raise some kind of you know awareness particularly among young creatives of what's happening in that space i'm going to do it because it's a it's a small it's a small thing that i can do and i also benefited from it myself when i was a when i was a student when dax the design and artist copyright society was being set up in the uk i by chance knew the lawyer that was working with them on setting up their copyright service and he said hey ben you should get involved that's the only reason why I did. And I benefited from that, you know, every year since being um, knee high to a grasshopper in creative terms. Um, I think, you know, it's important to be able to see this stuff coming, really. Ben, I share your uh, experience completely. Recently, I was invited uh, to a university uh, MBA program with a specialty in creative industries to talk about Web3. And I was astounded by the lack of understanding uh, that the MBA students had. Um, and the, the, the concern is that... Oh, 
I fear you have uh, frozen, Rohani. I'm gonna give her just a moment to uh, jump back in here. Is that any better? My back? Yeah, you're back. Okay, so uh, what I was saying was that I was uh, invited to present to a group of MBA students with a focus on the creative sectors to talk about Web3 and the impact it would have on the creative industries. And I was surprised by how little they actually knew or were interested in this space. And the concern is that right now, this transformation is happening, but it's being led by engineers, by IT people, and not by the creative sector, not by policymakers, not by lawmakers, right? And so we're catching up, right? So we, you know, a lot of a lot of talk about chat GPT, for example, mm. and AI now and generative AI and, and you know, long list of, of people saying, hey, we've got to stop because there's all these concerns, societal concerns that we have, but it's almost too late. And it's not as if this happened yesterday. This has been in the works for over a decade, if not three or four decades. And yet, because it's just the engineers that are working heads down on it and we're not paying attention or getting involved and we're just sitting back and waiting to see what interesting things they come up with, when it happens, it's almost too late. I, 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 I share your perspective, but I'm going to give a shout out as well to... Um, view nights who I work with who who aren't aren't just a team of techs it's that's a that's an example of a project that can happen when artists and technologists work together and, and I think Imprimo is a good example of that too and the work that we're doing at Prescient uh we're first and foremost a group of uh people that are uh dedicated to ensuring creators get paid that work on policy and legal issues around fair compensation and it's from that point of view that we are integrating and playing around from the mm. and just from the sense of this is really neat. Let's see what we could break with it. Yeah, and there's something that I, I feel arts organisations could be doing more of is mm -hmm. while the law is catching up, advocating for best practice. Because do you know what? I I don't think that the there is genuine malign intent behind a lot of what's happening in that space it's more that yes. in my experience if anything it's the fault of the arts for not engaging more in a way that might sound like a terrible thing to say yeah but i don't think i don't get the sense that the technologists don't want to work with the artists i think they do yeah, I think the uh, artists and the arts organizations could be helping them by saying, well, this is what good practice looks like. This is how you can develop a generative AI without exploiting artists IP. Yeah, I mean, um, it, it's easy to start blaming the victims and I, I don't want to go down that path. No, of course not. But at the same time, um, or something else to observe is that we speak a different language. Mm -hmm. And so we, we don't. Um, you know, just just the, uh, the the fact that we needed to start the call by explaining what a token is, what blockchain is, what a smart contract is, what a wallet is, basically how it works, etc. Um, we need to. That's why we need to stay uh, involved, right? When we started working on on blockchain, when we created Preston Innovation, one of our kind of a mission and message out to the creative sector generally and to other copyright management organization is that we need to be architects of Web3. We have to participate in its building blocks or mm -hmm. it will not work for creators. Um, and, and that's something that is, it's a depth message that is still uh, people get it, they hear it, they understand it, but then to engage with Web3 and to make it meaningful is much more difficult. Yeah, completely agree. Yeah, absolutely.